Hello, guys. I have a question for you. What do you think about when you hear the word chemicals? Do you think about a smelly gas or maybe some kind of poisonous liquid? Well, actually, everything around us is made of chemicals except light. So, for example, this rubber ducky is made of chemicals. My phone is made of chemicals. And highly likely that the device that you are watching me on right now is also made of chemicals. And the majority of these chemicals are actually solids. We know already that solids are composed of tightly packed particles. They retain their shape and the particles are not free to move around. So they are just kind of vibrating in one place. We can classify the solids based on the arrangement of their constituents, whether those are atoms, ions, or molecules. We can have atoms arranged in a regular repeating pattern, just like this nice brick wall here, and those would be solids that are called crystalline solids. And if the pattern is irregular, just like this wall shown right here, those are going to be amorphous solids. The name amorphous is coming from the Greek word that means shapeless. So in crystalline solids, we are going to have highly regular shapes and they are going to be relatively sharp. Amorphous solids, when they are broken, they produce fragments with very regular shapes. And interestingly, amorphous solids have no well-defined melting points, but crystalline solids have well-defined melting points. So why is that? Well, because in crystalline solids, we have a very regular pattern all bond energies are the same, but in amorphous solids, the atoms and molecules are all over the place, so the bonds have different strengths, so it takes different amount of energy to melt them. So they are going to melt in a temperature range. All right, I hope this makes sense. So what is an example of an amorphous solid? Glass is, for example, an amorphous solid. My little ducky here is made of an amorphous solid. An example of a crystalline solid, well, let's say diamonds, or just simple table salt. So from here, it makes sense to actually use a different type of classification because solids can be made of molecules, atoms, ions, and we have to be able to classify that. So we can use a classification based on the types of the bonding interactions. Metallic solids are going to be made of metals. And they are held together by an interesting sea of collectively shared of electrons. So here we have our metal ions. And because the electrons are relatively loose in these metal atoms, they share the electrons between each other. So this metal ion here might have its electron right here, but it's just kind of floating around and just travels around between all other metal ions. So they are all sharing their electrons and the electrons are going to create kind of a sea in which we are going to see the metal ions floating around. Now, metallic solids have variable hardness, melting point, and they actually conduct electricity. Then we can take a look at ionic solids. So ionic solids are composed of ionic compounds in which we have anions and cations, which are held together by ion-to-ion -ion interactions. We are going to have high melting points. The, these compounds are going to be brittle, hard, and they will not conduct electricity. What happens when we have atoms? Well, if we have a network of atoms held together by covalent bonds, we are going to produce so-called covalent network solids. So these are solids made of carbon or silicon. We're going to talk about these in more detail on the next slide. These solids have high melting points, they are hard, and they do not conduct electricity. Now, what about ice? We know that ice is made of water molecules, right? So when we have molecules held together by intermolecular forces, forces between the molecules, which are relatively weak, we are actually going to produce molecular solids. And these are going to have low melting points and they will not conduct electricity.
Now, let's do a practice problem. Let's try to figure out the type of these solids based on the bonding interactions. We will be differentiating between metallic solids, which are made out of metals, ionic solids, which are made out of ions, covalent network solids, which are made out of atoms that are held together by covalent bonds, and molecular solids that are made out of molecules held together by intermolecular forces. Okay, what is our first example? H2O, solid H2O or ice. Is it a metallic solid, ionic solid, covalent network solid, or molecular solid? H2O is a molecule, right? It is composed of nonmetals from the periodic table. So this is going to be a molecular solid. What about sodium chloride? What type of compound is that? We know that it is composed of Na plus and Cl minus ions, right? So this is table salt, which is an ionic solid. All right, what's next? Sodium, Na. What is it? We can check the periodic table. Well, sodium is right here. It is definitely a metal. So we are going to have a metallic solid. What about silicon? Hmm, is it a metal? Is it a non-metal? Well, silicon is actually right below carbon. So carbon atoms are bonded together with covalent bonds. And silicon, although it is a metalloid, going to have the same type of covalent bonding as carbon. Okay, so this is going to mean that silicon is actually a covalent network solid. So it is not a metal, it is a metalloid, and the atoms in silicon are held together by covalent bonds. Okay, what about the next one, ammonium bromide? What type of compound is this? Do we have a metal together with a non-metal? We don't, right? But what is NH4? That is the ammonium ion. So usually we find ionic solids when we have metals coupled together with nonmetals, right? Na plus Cl minus. Now in this case, the ammonium ion, the NH4 plus, replaces our metal. So this is actually going to be a polyatomic ion, NH4 plus. So it's going to be an ionic solid. Similarly, if I would have, like, let's say, sodium sulfate, the sulfate ion is a polyatomic ion, so that would be, again, an ionic compound, even though it's composed not only one metal and one nonmetal, but a polyatomic anion. I hope this makes sense. Okay, let's take a look at the next one. Sucrose, what is it? It's sugar. Hmm. Is it a molecular solid, a covalent network solid? Well, it seems to me that it's composed of nonmetals, huge molecules. So this should be a molecular solid. Okay, what's next? Carbon or diamond. So we know that carbon is a nonmetal, right? It is right here in the periodic table. And actually, carbon atoms in diamond are held together by covalent bonds, which are extremely strong. So, diamond is going to be a covalent network solid. What about GE, germanium? If you look at the periodic table, did you find it? So, it's right below silicon. Again, another metalloid which is going to form the same type of compound as silicon and carbon. So this is going to be a covalent network solid. What about calcium oxide? Is it a metal? Is it a nonmetal? Is it an ionic solid? Indeed, it is going to be an ionic solid because it's composed of calcium 2 plus and O2 minus ions, right? Calcium oxide. So, it's got to go to the ionic solids. What about quartz? So, usually, if you would look at this uh, structure, SiO2, you would say, hey, it's definitely a molecule, right? But actually, quartz is quite interesting. It's composed of silicon and oxygen atoms, which are held together with 
covalent bonds. This is going to be a covalent network solid. There are only a few of these, so quartz is one of these that you have to remember. So if you look at this figure right here, the gray atoms are going to be the silicon atoms, and the red atoms are the oxygen atoms and you can see that actually this oxygen atom right here or this oxygen atom right here is shared between two silicon atoms but in the formula unit in SiO2 we only have one silicon atom so the SiO2 simply tells us that hey for each silicon atom we are going to have two oxygen atoms but there is an actual covalent bonding between most most of those atoms. Okay, I hope this makes sense. What about silicon carbide? Well, silicon carbide actually going to do the same thing. It's going to be a covalent network solid. So if you remember carbon, metalloids, quartz, silicon carbide as a covalent network solid, you covered most of the covalent network solids that will come up in GenChem. All right, the last one is zinc. What about zinc? Well, where is it in the periodic table? Did you find it? Well, I found it. It's right here. It's a transition metal. So, and because it is a metal, it's going to be a metallic solid. Okay, I hope this makes sense. When we are talking about metallic solids, those are metals. When we are talking about ionic solids, those are ionic compounds. When we are talking about covalent network solids, those are atoms which are not metals and they are held together by covalent bonds. And when we see molecules, we are going to see molecular solids. All right, see you in the next video.